the kingdom of God. Dear Lord, give us understanding. Be with the preaching of Thy holy book at this time. We love You, Lord. We know Your kingdom is soon. God, we do pray You'll come quickly. May we be accounted worthy. In the name of Jesus, Amen. Amen. We do understand that salvation is by the grace of God. We do understand that it's not just by grace. It's by grace through faith alone. We do understand that there is a reward for holy living and there are negative rewards for unholy living. And after you are saved, if you don't live right, there is punishment in this life. And even though there's a lot of people that will lie to you about it, the Bible says, be not deceived. There is punishment when Jesus comes. There is punishment at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He will judge His people. Judgment begins actually at the house of God. You say, I've never been told that I could have anything uh, happen unto me that would uh, terrify me. Well, you've been deceived about that. This whole age has been deceived. This Dr. Spock, 1960, uh, if it feels good, psychological generation, you've been deceived. The whole age has been deceived. And we need to get back to the fear of God. And we're talking the fear of God for God's people. Don't get up here spitting and yelling, turning red in the face about how the unbeliever is going to be judged and how the fake Christian and false Christian is going to be judged. I'm going to tell you right now, the Bible says you, Christian, are going to be judged. You are going to be judged for how you live your life. We got to get it straight. We got to get it straight. There's a thousand year kingdom coming. The Lord said, Matthew 25, verse 30, Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 through 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 9 through 11, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 through 28. I'm telling you all throughout the Bible, it is clear there is punishment for believers. But we've been dealing with these sins here because. It's very important for you not to be practically unrighteous. It's very important for you not to walk in unrighteousness. If you walk in this fornication, if you become a fornicator after you're saved, then you are going to be disinherited from the kingdom of God. That means that you are going to be punished. You're not going to get the reward, the inheritance of the kingdom. We talked about adultery. We talked about the effeminate, which primarily has to do with cross-dressing. Women who love to wear men's clothes and men that wear women's clothes. I tell you what, that's an abomination to God. And this effeminate appearance and this feminine, effeminate character is associated with the next one that says abusers of themselves with mankind, which is what we call sodomy. It is self-abuse. It abuses the body. It's unclean and filthy. To God, it's a sin worthy of death. But today we're dealing with the sin up here in verse 9 called idolatry. We cannot deal in fullness with this sin because we're going to deal today just with practical idolatry. There is a covetousness that the Bible calls idolatry. And we're not going to deal with the covetousness aspect of idolatry today. We're going to deal with old-fashioned, practical, bowing down the statues, idolatry, okay? You say, well, if you're teaching Christians, shouldn't we have to be concerned with uh, covetousness and mammon and things like that? I'm going to tell you something. Uh, you would think that would be the case. But today, there are people that name the name of Christ that are actually bowing down to statues and praying to them. As the Catholic Church makes inroads, this ecumenical spirit, as the so-called emerging church emerges out of hell and uh, all of a sudden deceives this age, there are people bringing icons and images and statues and amulets and good luck charms and all of this stuff into the churches. Christmas trees and everything else, I tell you. It should be clear to every believer 
You know, I'm just going to say one word about that. I remember back when I would go see these movies down at the theater, try to find something wholesome, you know. And I remember going to something rated G or something. I can't remember what it was. And it's many, 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 many years ago. But I remember this little guy sitting up there looking at a Christmas tree, talking to it. And it was kind of like good luck to him. I said, wow. To a lot of these people, I tell you what, that, that thing is an idol, you know. Exodus chapter 20. The second commandment forbids idolatry. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graving image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth, colon. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Any picture, any symbol, any image which becomes so special to you that it takes on a religious life of its own and you begin to worship it, that representation of whatever it is becomes so powerful to you that you give it power, that you talk to it, that you begin to look at it in a religious, devotional way. That is idolatry. And you know that God forbids it. For I, the Lord, he said, don't bow down to them, nor serve them. That's interesting, isn't it? It's not just bowing down. You're not supposed to serve it. You think about that for a second now. For I, the Lord, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Do you know what you do now affects your offspring? Do you know it can affect them physically? I mean, you curse them financially by your sins. You, you might curse your whole generation financially. It might continue down to the third and fourth. You might fall into drunkenness and drugs and curse your offspring. There's ways that you can render God's vengeance upon you that it hurts your offspring. You think Daniel was a sinner? I'm going to tell you something. Daniel was a good boy. Why was he in prison? Why was Daniel sent off as a prisoner, as a slave? You know why? Because of the sins of his father. That's why Daniel, that's why Ezekiel, that's why those young men were cursed. Because it brought servitude to their generation. Idolatry is one of those things that God said will curse not just you, but it will continue. Because when God gets angry at the nation, those calamities continue for generations to come. Do you see this? Any believers who continue in Roman Catholic ways or New Age pagan ways, the title of my message is Idolatry, Catholic and New Age. It's pretty much the same thing. The Catholic Church tries to give paganism a Christian coding. It, it puts a little light Christian coding on it. Changes some of the terminology. But it's just paganism. People say, well, we're taking the symbols and the things that the heathen did and we're trying to use it for God. God never told you to do it. Where do you get precedent for that in the Bible? Where did Paul ever do that? I'll give you verses that say, don't do it. Well, that's not what the symbol means to me. Well, that's what it means to everybody else. The Bible says if you walk in these Roman Catholic ways, these New Age pagan ways of idolatry, you will not enter the Lord's coming. You know why? Because idolatry is an abominable sin. It says in Revelation 21, verse 8, the fearful. Are you afraid of man? Are you afraid of man to such a degree that you'll be silent? That you won't speak up for Jesus? The fearful, God says when He comes, He's going to be ashamed of them at His coming. They'll be in shame. They will not enter His kingdom. They're going to have their part in that fiery death that the Lord talks about at the judgment seat of Christ. Are you, fear, are you afraid to stand out from among them today and show that you are different? Are you afraid to be a peculiar person for Jesus? Are you afraid to say, you know what? I'm glad to be a young lady. I'm glad to be modest. I'm glad to be holy. Yes, I do respect my husband. And and I'm not ashamed of it. Yes, we do discipline our children and we're not ashamed of it. Yes, we do obey Jesus and we're not ashamed of it. You may call them old-fashioned ways, but we're not ashamed of it. 
The fearful is going to have their part in the lake of fire. That fire that comes out of the Lord's throne that He says, I'll cut you asunder at the judgment seat of Christ. The unbelieving, certainly the unbelievers that don't believe the gospel, but there's a lot of unbelieving Christians. They don't believe in the Lord's judgment seat. They don't believe the Lord's going to come soon. They don't believe that evil communications corrupt good manners. They don't believe a lot of things. Abominable. You say, now, who are the abominable? Anybody that commits those abominations that God says to me is an abomination. That's why when the Lord says effeminate, those that wear that which pertaineth unto a woman... A man that wears that which pertains to a woman is an abomination unto the Lord. So who are the abominable? Those that commit abomination. The woman that wears that which pertains unto a man, that's abominable. You are abominable to the Lord. If you commit the abominations that are written in the Bible, you are abominable. And you say, well, I don't really feel that bad. I feel like I'm spiritual. It doesn't matter. They're going to have a form of godliness in the last day. You say, well, this is terrible. Well, the Bible says it's terrible. The Bible says, knowing the terror of the Lord. The Bible says, let him be your dread. Let him be your fear. It's what the book says. The murderers. These people that murder their babies. They don't repent. They turn you over to the state to be executed. That's coming, folks. Murderers. Whoremongers. Those that have dealings with whore. Sorcerers. That's that Harry Potter generation of witchcraft. Idolaters, there they are right there, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Unbelievers will be there forever. Those that do not overcome and live right after they're saved will be hurt by it, says Jesus. You say, well, my doctor, my pastor, my preacher, my scholars that I read didn't tell me that. Well, I got it from the authority of Jesus. You read about it in Revelation. You read about it to the seven churches. You're going to be hurt of the second death, says the Lord. You say, well, you know what? These folks aren't going to listen to that type of preaching. I mean, that, that goes against most of modern Christianity. But look at modern Christianity. Look at where these preachers have got us. Look at the generation. Look at the children. Look at them now. They're in idolatry. I'm sick of their psychological preaching. It's time to stand up and preach it right. Our early fundamentalist fathers, they preached it right. Haldeman and Panton and Nee and Craig and all of these men. But nobody listened to them. They didn't listen to Ketchum. They didn't listen to all of these guys. They rejected it. They don't even know their names anymore. They think I'm a heretic because I dare preach what they preached. No, I'm not the heretic. You are the one that's lost your mind. I'm trying to help you think. So let's get this thing straight. I do not believe many of my fellow brethren are applying the Word of God properly. Satan is too powerful in this day and age for their little picnic preaching. Okay? Idolatry is too big of a sin that if you don't put the fear of God behind it, we're not going to be able to uproot it from our churches. The claim that Catholics make that they merely venerate the image is absurd. There is no biblical example of anyone in the Bible that was godly praying to an image. Or praying to anyone other than God. There is no example of anyone in the Bible praying to anybody that's dead. The Bible calls it necromancy. And I stood and looked the Catholic priest in the eyes. And I said across from his desk at his Catholic church, you're praying to dead people. And that is necromancy. And I began to open the Bible and read it. He came across that desk and cussed me out with profanities and says, you are not allowed to quote that Bible. You're not a priest. I am a priest. I am a priest. You're wrong about that. I am a priest. The Bible said we're a royal priesthood. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. I am a priest. And I tell you, it says right here in the Word of God, you are committing idolatry. 
He began to tell me about all the Buddhists that he has that come and worship with them. Or they are there in the Catholic Church and they're doing their little Buddhism and their little meditation and they're all one big happy family. I'm going to tell you, friend. So beware of the New Age movement on one side, and that New Age movement is nothing but old paganism, reviving, and it's in novels, it's in pictures, it's in movies, it's everywhere you look, and you've got to watch out for that New Age movement, and watch out for the growth of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church. Both of them are pagan, and they're just bringing paganism from two different sides. They're going to meet in the middle, and... Um, you got to watch out for it. Do you know idolatry is growing? Do you know, just checking some recent, you know, Google News, some headlines for pagan. These are some headlines that come up uh, just the other day, two days ago. Public, a police giving advice on witches and pagans. London Telegraph. Uh, there it is. Headline. Police are told how to deal with witches and pagans now. They're having so many pagans over... See, the British people are returning to their pagan roots. Now, God didn't make them like that, but they fell into this uh, druid witchcraft paganism, and they're just returning to their non-Christian roots. You understand that? Before they got converted by the Lord. And um, feminists and lesbians, new style of images and visions, bringing fem feminism into the churches... And they say, instead of doctrine and preaching and the old masculine things, we're in a feminist age. So we love icons. We love images, see. Then, of course, you have your pantheism, your meditation, where God says in the Bible, be still and know that I'm God, which means don't trust in anybody else. Uh, don't go off here and put your faith in anybody else. You be still and know that I will take care of your enemies. I will take care of your calamity, which means simply have faith and trust in God. They turn that around to me. Be still and meditate. Be still and let your eyes roll back in your head. Be still and be passive and uh, Eastern meditation and get you some cross or some religious symbol and pray to it or feel warm and fuzzy in front of it. I tell you what, that's entering churches everywhere today. Right down to the passion of Christ so-called that that blasphemer reprobate Mel Gibson who recently wrote that he feels horrible and terrible and just depressed. And I guess he does. He needs Jesus Christ. Somebody needs to give him the gospel. And he needs to get out of that Catholic blindness and get back with his wife and quit all of this mess. I tell you what, he's a drunken uh, person uh, uh, sitting here blaspheming our Lord and that whole Passion of Christ movie, movie. That's basically, these people are looking at that as an idol. I'm telling you, there's people that are worshiping those images. It's wicked. They think that's Jesus. And, and, uh, that long hair uh, 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 pornographer whoever he was that, that, that dared to stand up and play Jesus, it's wicked from hell, and you need to stay away from that stuff. You say, but it makes me feel so warm and fuzzy. So do all the statues. You say, the movies make me feel warm and fuzzy. Well, that's what a Catholic says when he looks at the crucifix. See, we've got issues today. Y'all listening? Jesus said idolatry will continue to grow. The book of Revelation in Revelation 9 says the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands. What's wrong with the works of their hands? Oh, wait a second. That they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Do you know we are not preterists here? We're futurists. We believe the book of Revelation is future. We do not believe that it's all been fulfilled. What this verse is saying is right before the second coming of Christ, God's going to curse the world. It's going to get hotter and hotter and hotter. There's going to be earthquakes. The water's going to dry up. Men are going to be scorched. It's going to be horrible. And in the midst of it all, everybody's looking for a way to get out from under all of the curses. But God said none of them will repent of their idolatry. They've all got statues and good luck charms and amulets and rabbit feet and crucifixes and New Age crystals and all these little things that they're looking to and worshiping and all of that. And God says they won't repent of it. None of them will repent of it. 
Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornications, nor of their thefts. Just to give you some idea of what the world... It already looks like that now, doesn't it? I mean, you just read the headlines. That's our world. What's another headline here? Um, uh, it said something about... Um, it awakes now. Marching. There it is. Thank you, brother. Another headline. Uh, pagans on the march. The rise of paganism in the 21st century. Millions and millions and millions of little pagans reading Harry Potter. That, which, and that's just one way the devil's working. They're all growing up and getting into real paganism. So what does God say to do? 1 Corinthians 10, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flirt with idolatry. God forbid. Flee from idolatry. Run from it. It will grab a hold of you. Just like fornication. This is one of those things. You don't stand and fight. You run from it. I tell you, you go to these oriental stores and they got some big fat Buddha looking thing. And you look at all this fruit and food, you're like, what are they, what's all this good food doing out here? They're feeding it to a statue that doesn't even eat. And even if he did, he wouldn't eat any more food. First John 5. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. I believe God here is speaking literally to the little children. Little children. Little children. Little children that name the name of the Lord. Keep yourselves from idols. Well, that's a good thing to tell this generation, isn't it? As they begin to idolize somebody that uh, lets their hair grow longer and, and, you know, plays on a guitar or something, they idolize them. Some sports hero, he throws the ball around, they say, oh, I just idolize him skateboarding or this or that. He's just, you idolize, keep yourselves from idols, little children. Sports heroes. The world calls them stars. They even call one show American Idol. They don't even try to hide it. American Idol. We want to idolize somebody. Make an idol out of them. And when you wear them all over your clothes and glorify them and give them so much of your life when Jesus gets so little, what else is that but idolatry? There's folks that won't come to church because it might take time away from their idolatry. They want to sit at home and watch their idols. They might not call it worship, but neither does the Catholic Church all the time. But when you give something more honor than you give God, that's idolatry. Good luck charms. You have a good luck charm, you're committing idolatry. If you follow all these little pagan superstitions, that's occultism. Don't walk under a ladder. I tell you what, I've, I've had that stuff lined up in here. I've been under a ladder. I did it all just to show it's from hell. You understand that? It's wicked. It's devilish. It's stupid. And believers ought not be bound by such nonsense. Don't open an umbrella inside. Why not? You believe Satan has power? Give me an umbrella. I'll open it all over the place. Give me a ladder. I'll show you every bit of it. The Bible said the wicked one touches him not. You don't have to play that kind of nonsense. You're a Christian. You ought to stand up and quit following such nonsense. My lucky shirt, my lucky this, my lucky that. God hates it all. Making any picture or image more than a mere symbol is idolatry. Do you know in the Catholic Church, they make the cross into an idolatrous object? They got their holy water 
You know, even the bread of the Lord's Supper, so-called, when they have their communion, do you know what they do with the bread of the Lord's Supper? That priest stands up there and he's supposed to do some type of hocus-pocus. And what he does is he turns that bread into the literal body of Jesus. And they say it's literally Jesus' body. So everybody worships that bread. They hold it up for veneration, for worship, so you can adore the little Eucharist, the little sun god. Yes, I'm talking to you, Catholic. They hold it up. And well, you ought to be nice to us. Being nice doesn't mean that we sweep under the rug your abominations. If you're going to get saved, you need to hear it for what it is. You are worshiping a cookie, a cracker. The Lord called it my body, you say. The Lord said also, I'm the door. I'm the good shepherd. He's not a literal door. Why don't you pray to doors? Why don't you, when you see a door, why don't you get down and worship it? It's ridiculous. That's a symbol to remember the Lord's death till He come. And when you turn a symbol into something other than a symbol, you're committing idolatry. First Corinthians 12, you know that you were Gentiles carried away under these dumb idols even as you were led. All of you followed a bunch of dumb idols, a bunch of dumb rock bands, rap bands, whatever they were, a bunch of dumb movie so-called star, a bunch of uh, sports star, whatever it is. You know you're all led by your dumb idols. That's what God said. Superstitious. Gentiles. Superstitious. But when you come to Christ, it's time to put away all your little idols. Things should not become so serious and important to you that you give them some type of power over you where you're going to cry and get yourself upset. It's just ridiculous. It's idolatry. I wonder how much idolatry is going on among Christians. Acts 15, write unto them, talking about the Gentiles that used to be carried away with these dumb idols, that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. You ought not eat like a Gentile. And you ought not fall into these wicked Idols that the Gentiles love. And you ought not live like a Gentile where fornication is considered something routine and common. And Galatians 5 says idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envying, murder, drunkenness, revelings. And then he finally just says and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I've told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. What's at the top of the list? Idolatry. Do you know Paul preached to even unsaved people against idolatry? You think about that for a second. Because there's people out there in this nice, effeminate age that don't want you to dare ruffle the feathers of a lost person. Don't speak to the lost person about sin. Just give them a drink of water. You know, well, you know, I believe that you ought to be nice. And, but, but the truth of the matter is, is that you need to preach to them also. And my authority is Paul. If you say I should never deal with an unsaved person about their sin, says who? What authority? Show me in the book. Show me in the Bible. I'll show you Paul in Acts 17. And I think he knows more about it than you do. While Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Was that a Christian city? No. You say, well, why is he upset? Because they're men. They're human beings. And by natural law, they ought to know that you shouldn't pray to a bunch of sticks and stones and false gods. His spirit was stirred in him. I wonder if there's any Christians today to get their spirit stirred about anything. 
Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market with them that met with him. And he stood up in Mars Hill and said, you men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. What did he tell them? He said, you bunch of unsaved, Gentile, heathen believers, you think you're smart, but you're not. You're superstitious. For as much as we are the offspring of God, we ought not think that the Godhead is likened to gold or silver or stone. The times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. That wasn't a wink of approval. That was a wink of I'm about to kill them and I'm losing patience. And now that Jesus has come, I tell you what, he's boiling hot, ready to go. You understand that? He's tired of it. He's not dealing with it anymore. So Paul said, you're in a lot of trouble. God commands you to repent of your idolatry. And any person that you see, if they're a human being and they have idols, I don't care if they're a Christian or not, you need to tell them to quit their idolatry. Do you know what brought persecution to the apostles? In the Jewish world, it was the name of Jesus. And telling the Jews that they crucified their Savior. But in the Gentile world, do you know what brought persecution to the apostles? Speaking against the sin of idolatry. The Gentile world doesn't care if you mention Jesus. They don't care if you preach the gospel. They wouldn't persecute you for that. They persecute you for saying your idols are not God. Let me show you. Acts 19. Moreover, you see in here... That not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul have persuaded and turned away much people, saying they be no gods which are made with hands. What was Paul doing? What every Christian ought to be doing? Preaching everywhere. Those aren't gods. You see that big fat Buddha? That's not God. You see that crucifix hanging from your neck? That's not God. It has no religious value whatsoever. You see all of this stuff? You see these people, these singers? They're not God. These are all idols. That's what Paul did. And you know what it brought Paul? Once people started listening, who got angry? You know who got angry? The people that make the idols. The people that make money off of the statue. They began to get angry. The love of money is the root of all evil. Persecution begins when somebody's losing money because of your preaching. So it says that not only our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. And when they heard these things, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. What brought on persecution against Paul? Silversmiths. Men that made money making religious statues stirred up everybody to persecute Paul and the other Christians because Paul was speaking against their little statue. Don't you tell me a Christian should not speak against the sins of an unbeliever. Ultimately, what they need to do is believe upon Jesus and get saved. But they need to know that stick's not God. They need to know that Jesus is not just some idol to add to their other idols. When missionaries went to heathen countries, they had to explain that. Because a lot of them would say, sure, Jesus is fine. But they thought that they were just adding Jesus to a list of a hundred other gods and statues. They had to explain to them, no, He is the only God. And all these others are not God. Do you know you can be quiet in the... Was Paul quiet? Was Paul quiet when he was around the unsaved Gentiles? Was he quiet? You know why I know he wasn't quiet? Because he stirred up the unbelievers to get angry at him. Don't just go purposely make them angry. But if you make them angry because you're telling them the truth, then that's right. Now, you can be quiet and you won't be persecuted probably. Look at 2 Timothy 3. Yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Is that what it says? 
But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Did it say every Christian will receive persecution? Did it say every believer will receive persecution? Who's going to receive persecution? Those who live godly. Those who are not just playing games right now. Those that will stand up and rebuke the sins of their age. You'll suffer persecution. But the Lord says when you suffer persecution, don't get depressed. Rejoice. In fact, He says leap for joy. That's what He says. Because great is your reward in heaven. Today they want to play with the people's idols. They want to affirm them. They want to make idolaters feel warm and cozy in their sins. They want to make them feel that they can have Jesus and their idols. And this will be all right with Jesus. They have nothing to fear for idolatry. And that's just a, that's just a lie. 1 Thessalonians 1, they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And if you get saved by the blood of Jesus and you know your sins are forgiven and you know that Jesus is God and that He died for you, the Son of God, I'm going to tell you the next thing you need to do is get rid of all the idols out of your house. You need to get rid of idolatry and that's how you come in fellowship with God. After you get saved, God wants you to take a step where you come into fellowship with Him. I wonder if there's a lot of believers that have never even taken a step of fellowship with God. They are unfruitful. They still have those idols. And God can never fellowship with them like He wants to. Praise God for the Thessalonians. They left their idols. You say, well, I know some believers that are Catholics. Well, if that's true, then they need to get out of the Catholic Church and get rid of that name, Catholic. Because Roman Catholics are idolaters. Well, well they're really saved. They, they really believe in the grace of God. Great! Now let them come out from among them, my people, saith God. Come out from among her, my people, saith God. Come out and be separate. Abhor! And show your children that you abhor it. I think it will be helpful in closing this section on idolatry. If I can give you some history as we close. I want to challenge you to listen up to some history. It's a history of compromise. I want to show you how the Catholic Church arose. And I want to show you from their own writings how the Catholic Church arose and how they justified praying to statues and images and such like. You say, well, what can we learn from that? You can learn that when people tell you that we need to accommodate pagans, you can learn that what they're doing today has already been done and it brought the world into the greatest period of dark ages that's ever been in history, except for one other period, and that's what's coming. And why is it coming? Because they are accommodating pagans. Instead of being light to the world, instead of being sought to the world, instead of hindering, like it says in Thessalonians, what they're doing, instead of resisting the Spirit, they are helping it. We've got to be nice, see. As the humanists said, Christians, they're easy to deceive because all you got to do is come to them and tell them, now be nice and, and, and use Christian language and they'll help us. That's what they said. You've got humanists and socialists that says, Christians, if you speak in their little nice language, they'll help you. They'll, they'll be so deceived, they'll help you destroy themselves. And normally I'd get angry, but, but you know, they're right. They're right about many Christians today. So let's look at some history. This is from John Dowling's History of Romanism from 1845, a Baptist writer. But we're going to quote a lot of Catholic writings here. He says, A bishop during the first and second century was a person who had the care of one Christian assembly, which at that time was, generally speaking, small enough to be contained in a private house. 
When these people say, oh, my bishop, you know, who are you You're talking about your pastor of your church? Oh, oh, no, he's over a diocese of many churches. Where's that in the Bible? Where's that in the Bible? Is that how it was in the Bible? And it wasn't like that in the first and second century. He was a pastor of one church. And generally speaking, the church was small enough to be contained in a private house. That's how it was in those days. The Christian churches were independent of each other. This church didn't tell the church down the road what they needed to do with their people. You know why? Because they don't know the business that's going on there. But in a council held in 588, we're jumping ahead here, it took a lot of centuries to enter into the perversion that finally became the Catholic Church. In 588, John, the bishop of Constantinople, assumed the title of universal bishop. Supposing that the design of his rival was to obtain the supremacy over all Christian churches, Gregory, who they call Gregory the Great, opposed his pretensions. And here's what Gregory the Great, who they call Pope Gregory the Great, this is what Gregory wrote in response to the Bishop of Constantinople calling himself the universal bishop. Pope Gregory said, quote, Whoever adopts or affects the title of universal bishop has the pride and character of Antichrist and is in some manner his forerunner. So, the Catholic Roman Pope Gregory, the bishop, wrote at this time, that whoever calls himself a universal bishop is a forerunner of Antichrist. But only two years after Gregory's death, Pope Boniface III sought for and obtained the title of universal bishop. So according to Catholic writings, if we're going to believe so-called Pope Gregory, whoever takes this title is an Antichrist. So the present Pope who uses these types of titles, he's a forerunner of Antichrist, if not the Antichrist. Previous to the year 606, there was properly no Pope. That is, as the supreme sovereign pontiff and boasted head. In the 4th century, says Geisler, the worship of images was still abominated as a heathen practice. You didn't have any of this mess going on in the 4th century. That's 300 years after Christ. In the 5th century, a singular efficacy was attributed to the bones of martyrs and to the figure of the cross in defeating the attempts of Satan and removing all sorts of calamities. So see, by the time you get to the 5th century, oh, grab the cross and that'll bring us good luck. Uh, uh, Let's look at the bones of martyrs. Is that Timothy's finger bone? If it is, let's put that in the house and maybe we'll be blessed financially. It'll keep the tornadoes away. The practice of thus accommodating the forms of Christian worship to the prejudices of the heathen nations was introduced in various places long before the establishment of popery in 606. Though, of course, as there was no then acknowledged earthly sovereign and head of the churches, the observance of these heathen rites was not regarded as obligatory. So in other words, he's saying you had people worshiping bones and looking at crucifixes as having power, but there was no head. There was no church structure. Uh, There was no ecclesiastical authority to tell you that this is what you had to do. The account of Gregory, this is Gregory I, who they call Gregory the Great, Pope Gregory. The account of Gregory's instructions to Augustine as related by Bauer in Bauer's History of the Popes, is as follows. Not satisfied with directing Austin not to destroy, but to reserve for the worship of God the profane places where the pagan Saxons had worshipped their idols, Gregory Gregory would have him treat the more profane usages, rites, and ceremonies of the pagans in the same manner. He writes, Whereas it is a custom among the Saxons to slay abundance of oxen and sacrifice them to the devil, you must not abolish that custom, but appoint a new festival, not to the devil, but to God. So Pope Gregory, the so-called great, he's the one that decided, 
Listen, when you're dealing with these pagans over there in France and the Saxons and the Gauls, and you're over there dealing with all them pagans, let them have their custom. If they like their little trees and all of their uh, uh, yule logs and they like all, let them have it. But just Christianize it. The Franks who had settled in the south of Gaul, now France, had been indulged at that time in the use of images. So Serenus, the bishop of Marseilles, could not bear it. And therefore, to show his abhorrence of such abominations, he caused all the images in France, these pagans, to, to be pulled down and destroyed. Amen. And he thought, oh, Gregory the Great in Rome would be happy. But Gregory the Great, the compromiser, what did he say? He acted consistently with himself. For having had directed Austin this very year to introduce pagan rites and usages in the church, he could not but blame Serenus for thus excluding them. And he wrote him accordingly, blaming him for breaking them. And he says, to prevent their being worshipped since they served the prejudice, the barbarians, that is, the Franks among whom he lived. Likewise, Gregory the Three in A.D. 731, wrote a letter to the emperor justifying image worship. The emperor did not understand it. So Gregory the Third in A.D. 731, wrote to the emperor and says, because you are unlearned and ignorant, we are obliged to write to you rude discourses. We conjure you to quit your pride. You say that we adore stones, walls, and boards. It is not so, my Lord. But these symbols make us recollect the person's whose names they bear. If it be an image of Jesus, we say, Lord, help us. If it be the image of His mother, we say, pray to your Son to save us. Putting all that into perspective, what does it mean? It means that the Roman bishop began by degrees to declare himself in charge of all the other pastors around the world. And a lot of pastors told the Roman bishop, take a hike. Go soak your head. You have no authority to tell me anything. Just like if some pope wrote a letter to my church today and said, I adjure you by the keys of Peter that you put religious icons and pray to them in your church. I tell him to go soak his head. Who in the world do you think you are? You're not pope around here. And that's how pastors treated but over time, he gained more power and gained more power and gained more power to pretty soon now he was competing with the emperor himself. And the emperor was saying, you guys are a bunch of pagans. Why are you worshiping a bunch of sticks and stone? And the Roman pope, bishop of Rome, would write these emperors and say, you just don't understand what we're doing. Well, pretty soon, of course, the Pope got more powerful than the Emperor, where the state had to bow and be subordinate to the Roman, because the Roman, a, a bishop would just say, I'll excommunicate you. And if I excommunicate you, you've lost all your power, at least in the eyes of the superstitious people. Jeremiah 10 says, Thus saith the Lord, learn not the ways of the heathen. Their customs are vain, saith God. Their customs are vain. Learn not their ways. They have no light for you. Let's learn God's ways. Let's keep God's customs. Let's keep God's traditions that are in the Word of God. Amen? So if somebody says, where did the Catholic Church come from? Say, there wasn't a Catholic Church in the days of Peter. There wasn't a Catholic Church for centuries afterwards. The first attempt was when Constantine and the... Uh, 312 or something A.D. began to unite Christianity with the church, that, uh, uh, with, with Christianity with the state. That was the first attempt. But even that wasn't Roman Catholicism. It took a few more centuries for the Roman bishop to gain power. And then, how did they end up with statues and images? Pragmatism. Church growth movement. Accommodation. He said, I've got to keep peace with these guys up there. They're used to their pagan customs. Just keep the statue. Put Mary on it. Tell them they can't call it Diana anymore. Put Mary on it. That's what they did. We don't want to make them mad. We want to keep them in our churches. 
We want to keep peace throughout the empire. Let them have their statues and stuff and, you know, just try to sprinkle holy water on it and, and try to make it Christian. Christianize it. Let's Christianize the rock music. Let's Christianize Hollywood. Let's Christianize everything, you know. Keep it all the same way, but just sprinkle a little bit of Jesus on it. Is that the environment of today? It was the environment that brought everybody into the dark ages and made true Christians have to go to the mountains. You know where the true Christians were in the dark ages? They're up in the mountains. They had nowhere else to go. They were being persecuted and killed. Well, we're entering some dark ages right now, folks. Dear Lord, help us. Flee idolatry to learn not the ways of the heathen. None of us, Lord, want to miss your coming kingdom because of idolatry. Lord, let us fear you. Let us take your words with trembling, with fear and trembling. We love you, Lord. Help us show that we love you by obeying your commandments. Lord, if there's anybody here that has good luck charms and talks about luck and are superstitious, Lord, oh God, pray that You'll help them have the strength to get rid of their idolatry. In the name of Jesus, amen.